именно профильный спикер по теме Open Banking Рене Понградс. Он вице-президент по маркетингу и продажам компании Adorsis. Компания, которая фактически знает все обо всех моделях открытого банкинга в разных странах, имеет опыт работы и фактически обо всем этом нам сегодня расскажет Рене. Тема доклада «Перспективы развития open banking в Европе». Единственный будет нюанс, что Рене записал свое видео, потому что проблемы определенные со здоровьем, сейчас все болеют. Поэтому у нас будет видео, а потом Рене подключится в онлайн, и мы сможем задать ему вопросы. У нас будет переводчик. Вот, так что, пожалуйста, слушайте видео. Сейчас мы его включим. Готовьте вопросы, и мы сможем вживую поговорить с Рене. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next session. Thanks for having me for the Global Payments Day. My name is Rene Pongratz. I'm Vice President Marketing and Sales in Adorsis. No worry, I will not do a sales talk. By the heart, I am a computer scientist. I studied that long time ago. And I spent the last around eight years in the banking domain. Moved then and went to Adorsis. And I'm employed in there for almost three years now in the management. My key domains are open banking, open finance, API management, and mobile solutions. Today, I want to talk about open banking in Europe through PSD2, the motivation behind PSD2 and open banking, and the impacts that come along with this new strategy. First, First, let, let me, me talk, talk about, about Adorsis, Adorsis to give you some insights. insights. Adorsis, Adorsis is a company, a company in Germany, Germany located in Nuremberg. In Nuremberg. We, we have, have currently around 130 employees. employees. And mm -hmm. our experience comes from over 15 years work in the finance industry, in the insurance industry, in the tax industry together with our partner Golden Dimension from Ukraine, we created a lot of open source products for open banking and PSD2. With these products, we were able to make 60 banks compliant to the law in Europe already. So our expertise clearly is in API managing, API management, everything that comes along with that, identity and access management, data mining, data security, smart analytics, and so on. Our knowledge, we catch by the engagement in several boards. For example, the Berlin Group Advisory Board, the Next Generation PSD2 Implementation and Support Program, but also some boards in Switzerland, this is no new, like the Swiss FinTech Innovation Board or Open Banking Project Switzerland or Standardization Committees. And as already mentioned, with API management, always security comes along, so we are also a member of OpenID. A short overlook of our network and partners. We work together with small institutes and small partners like fintechs or startups, but we work together with big ones like Amazon and Oracle as well. So this broad picture here gives us really good insights in the markets and we learn where the pains and gains are. And so we can react on that. Coming to open banking. First, let's talk about why open banking. It has been a while I was talking to people from regulatory institutes, asking them the question, why do you come up with a law like PSD2? And they told me, actually, there are two main drivers for that. Number one, there is a fear of big tax. So if you look to the US market, you will find Google, Amazon, Apple. These are really big players. 
tremendous amount of money, customers, infrastructure. They could easily jump into the to the game of playing bank. And the question is, what will traditional banks then answer? How will they compete? So they have to leave the comfort zone and probably think their business in a new way. So one driver is breaking up the letter key in banks. The, the next driver and main driver is security. Payments for end customers must be more secure. Looking at numbers, already in 2017, <clears throat> we could see that WeChat Pay exceeded in terms of transaction volumen, MasterCard and Visa. 2015, we or Visa had 9,000 transactions per second. Alipay had 87,000 transactions per second in a peak. These numbers show that there is a high disruption in the finance market and it started already some years ago. The banks we have and I think it will be pretty the same in your country. Frankly speaking, they are direct descents of banks from the Middle Ages. And this is something that must change. So the banks have to adopt a new mindset, thinking in new business models to be prepared for the future and to have a chance in the competition that started already. Let's dive a little bit deeper into PSD2. First, a short sum up. What is PSD2 again? So the Payment Service Directive 2 for Europe. It is a European law and it requests that banks have to open themselves via public APIs covering payment services, PIS, account information services, AIS, and payment issue instrument services, such as confirmation of funds, PIIS. All these services must be provided free of charge and in the same good quality as the banks provide the services in the online banking world. On top, everything is secured with a strong custom authentication by a second factor. So in a nutshell, PSD2 is a non-discriminating law, means same services in online banking must be provided as APIs. How does it look like? We have two flows. Without PSD, we have a payment service user here on top, the end customer, who stands in a one-to-one -one relation with the banks. So the PSU simply consumes services and products from the banks. This is a known model to the banks. They know this model since years. Now with PSD2, a new player comes into the game. We call it a third-party provider, FinTech Startups. Any company who has great ideas, great innovations, and just need a bank, or let's say the banking services. So these companies here are the innovation drivers, and they need service providers like banks. This is the new game. And everything on top is secured by a second factor or a strong customer authentication. And I think it is pretty clear that banks first have to get used to this new model or way of thinking because obviously they lose this one-to-one -one connection in relation with the customer and that feels initially a little bit strange and uncomfortable. Fully understand that. Impact. 
what does open banking and PSD2 in special in Europe, which impacts does it bring? So looking at the technical side, we know that most of the banks created the IT infrastructure in a pretty monolithic way, means big components, um, very rigid and slow in changing them. So usually banks have four major releases a year where they put in the um, changes and that is not enough any longer. So they had to migrate now from this legacy IT to a modern component based IT. Of course, this is heavy, heavy work. So what happens? They will cut and slice their services and monolithic systems into many components and they start to orchestrate and compose them as needed for the business in upper layers and probably again one layer above they will compose or modify or prepare APIs um, so that they suit the channels they offer like mobile channels or web channels or dedicated APIs to third party providers and so on. So this is a big change for them, but it's a very, very necessary change because first of all, with this new um, setup of having a third party provider in between, you never know the load these new companies are creating with your systems. Um, this means you have to find, you have, as a bank, you have to find a way how you can scale up fast and efficient um, so that you can stand the load. And this exactly um, will be done with this component-based architectures. Another thing you have to consider is that you have to be very careful that the STA, the strong customer authentication, is consistent through, um, through all channels. Um, you have probably to rethink the API life cycle and um, the impacts of uh, the organization behind because probably developers need new um, quality gates where somebody or new roles where somebody says, okay, now the API is fine, release it. Um, modifications in the CICD pipeline, things like that. Nevertheless, of course, you have to provide test data and test accounts. And um, this is still a problem for some banks to do that, not to break with GDPR. With the second factor, another, let's say, problem comes into the game. It is that um, in the flow of doing a payment, or getting account information. That is the point where users have to put in the second factor somewhere. And very likely they have to change the systems. Maybe they have to use the second mobile app or they will be redirected to a banking portal where they have to type in the second factor. This is a break in the flow and makes the user experience pretty ugly. So it is also up to the banks to think how can this user experience kept in the best way for the customers. Another thing that um, comes along when I talk about the impacts is the business and the organizational changes. So banks, they move from B2C business to customer to a B2B2C business. Um, that requires new thinkings in many ways. For example, when it comes to monetizing the services. So um, it is clear that as said before, banks have to offer the uh, needed services um, required by the law, but, and, and and they obviously cannot be really monetized because they have to be free of charge, but they can put um, added value services in parallel, putting it in the same framework. And this is how earning, money earning starts. 
then um, you have to think about a new strategy for sales and marketing and probably um, emphasize the relationships with partners and uh, letting the network uh, grow because as a bank you can then include partner services into your ecosystem um, to yeah, um, level up the service portfolio for your customers. And nevertheless, always concentrate on your unique selling point because you want to be interesting for others, for the consumers in the market, especially if you think of partnerships. <clears throat> Something um, happened in Europe regarding PSD2 that is a pretty dark side. PSD2, um, as mentioned several times, is a law. And there were several boards like the Berlin Group who concentrated on a specification that will help the banks to implement the law um, in a more easy way but as it is just i call it a best practice book um, and not a standard some um, ugly things happened so um, you could and, and and that's a fact many um, banks they um, took the berlin group specification and implemented it on their side but of course they were allowed to implement it in the way that it didn't cause much pain. And that means probably some modifications were done so that it made the life easier in the implementation phase. And this is fully okay because it is not a standard. It is a can, not a must. So what we have in the European market now, we have a lot of, we call it flavors of the Berlin Group specification, all similar, but with a little difference. And that makes it very, very heavy for the TPPs to integrate against that APIs. They have a lot of integration efforts and costs and this, of course, hinders the innovation to grow. So this blocks it. Something that really strictly should be avoided. And we can see that in our neighbor country in Switzerland, they already talk about standards. They are not bound to BSD2 because they are not EU. But of course, they, they, they started to deal with this topic and they think in standards already. So hopefully they will make it better than the rest of Europe. So established standards that helps reducing the integration costs on TPP side, facilitate an easy, fast access to the open banking APIs for these 30 party providers. And think big, think in cross-border services, because only if you consider this last point, it will be a real competitor to the big ones and probably this then can reduce the fear of the disruption in the payment or in the finance market so i hope um, you got some insights what is going on here in the european side uh, regarding open banking thanks for listening stay healthy and now I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Уважаемые друзья, у нас сейчас есть переводчик. У нас есть несколько вопросов и Рене. Рене, hello. Hello. Hi. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks a you? lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. We highly appreciate it. And so we have a translator and we have a number of questions to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will translate it uh, from Russian into English, so you will be able to answer that. Yes, fine. So the first one. 
Okay, so the first yeah. question is, what are the risks uh, for realization of uh, open banking in uh, developing countries, uh, especially in the conditions of crisis and uh, COVID? Okay, well, the risks depend on which side you look. So if you look on the consuming side, the TPPs, а ризики залежать від того, з якої сторони ви знаходитеся. Тобто, якщо ми говоримо про TPP, they have to ensure that they will not run out of money in terms of integration costs. А їм потрібно переконатися, що вони не витрачають всі гроші на інтеграцію. In terms of the banks, it is more a question um no it is it is a little bit more independent from covid or or any diseases it is a matter of just doing it а зі сторони банку вони незалежні від ковіду просто питання в тому як це все організувати okay the next one next one is uh how do you see the integration of uh, uh, developing countries uh, with the system um, of the countries that are already uh, that have already implemented uh, open banking? I would say it is a big chance, a good opportunity for these countries now. It's a hard chance, and it's a hard chance for these countries. Because they can learn from the countries who already installed it. Тому що вони мають можливість навчитися на практиці від країн, які вже імплементували open banking. Exactly. So they can avoid the the problems and mistakes that were done by the other countries. І можуть уникнути всіх проблем та помилок, які вже було зроблено. Yeah. So we have the next one, this one. Um, do you think that it's important to uh, develop standards and uh, for the market or just uh, make um, government be in charge? I would say both is okay as long as there are standards. Uh, Оскільки, якщо ми тільки за умови, якщо ми маємо стандарти, будь-який варіант підходить. Як я вже відповідав на друге питання, можете повчитися на досвіді країн, які вже це зробили, адже, як я говорив, в Європі немає стандартів. Yeah, and I'm talking about standards in terms of open banking. Я говорю про стандарти open banking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm nice. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Rene, maybe the question from, from myself. Uh, we had a number of discussions today, and so we discussed um, how long it will take uh, from the law, uh, uh, any adjustments till the full implementation on the market, those directives on open banking, just any uh, market player to adopt to them. So we had uh, suggestions about 36 months or even less or even more. What is your mm. suggestion on that and your experience? Okay. If I take the experience that we gain from, from our market, PSD2, and that's open banking, is running for two years already. Якщо дивитися на наш досвід, на PSD2, це вже два роки. Now we are at a situation or at a point where the banks, I would say, made their homework. Зараз ми знаходимося в ситуації, яку б я назвав, банки працюють над домашнім завданням. And now fintechs and um, TPPs can start working with it. І фінтехи та TPP можуть почати працювати. And until everything is now um, combined in a proper way, I would estimate another two years probably. So in total, 
four to five years, I would say. Загалом чотири-п'ять років, поки всі всі компоненти не будуть працювати. So around four to five years, yeah. Тобто загалом чотири-п'ять, чотири-п'ять років. Okay. Okay, we will take it in mind. So, thank you so much. René, unfortunately, we don't have uh, time anymore for, for this discussion, but we have strong connection to you, and we hope you will, uh, you will help us in those adoption for open banking in Ukrainian markets. So, let's, let's stay in touch. It would be a pleasure. Yeah, thank and you. thank you so much for joining. Okay, bye.